Okay, who are you and where are you from? Sorry. My name is Jeremy Monge. My name is CJ. It's uh, Christopher J. Puelas. My name is Daniel Quinones. I'm from the South Bay of Los Angeles. That's where I grew up. I've lived here in LA my whole life. I was born in San Diego, California, but I was raised in Fresno, California. Uh, I moved out to LA seven years ago, and uh, I've been here ever since. I was born in um, Puerto Rico, uh, raised in Houston, Texas, in Ailey. Came over to the States when I was really little. Seven people in a one bedroom apartment, first generation American. What, uh, what do you do? Uh, I'm a woodworker, fabricator. I am by trade a tattoo artist. I'm an artist first. I build furniture. I also build props and sets for television and movies. I do a lot of custom cabinet work. Um, working in multi-million dollar homes. Uh, when I'm working on television shows, I'm doing either makeover shows or reality game type shows. Building usually crazy, unique props or set pieces. How'd you get into tattooing? Well, I was an electrician for about six years, pretty much straight out of high school. I uh, couldn't stand being an electrician from day one wasn't really my place. We got laid off when the economy took a plunge and uh, I swore I was never going back to that and I always loved to draw and do art so it was like I don't know what I'm gonna do but I'm gonna do something with my art and then I started getting intrigued with tattoo art naturally just looking at tattoo art. The, the artist bug was definitely implanted in me at a young age um, my mom's an artist. She would pull uh, all of us actually while we were playing outside in the house just to draw us and sketch us. So it was definitely uh, a, an upbringing that was nurtured in the arts. You know, living in Houston, uh, Boston, Italy, New York, San Francisco, all these different places was just a culmination of that pursuit of art. Well, I, you know, I was a kid raised in Houston in A Leaf Dream, that whole dream. I want to be an artist in New York kind of thing. The first chance I could have got out, that's, well, you know, I took it, I think I was like 17. Within that whole process of, you know, finding out where my art fits, because it was dark and, you know, people thought that I was on drugs or had this traumatic childhood, which kind of, so, Navigating through that, that kind of artwork just didn't fit in Houston. From Boston to New York and all this kind of stuff landed in California and from there started designing, directing, um, animation, motion design, uh, own clothing brands, have companies with my wife uh, that help other artists. So it's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things that you have to do as a, you know, as an artist, especially as an entrepreneur artist, that you have to just get your hands into everything to be able to sustain yourself in one of the most expensive places to live in the world. <laughs> what drives you to create? Where'd that passion come from? Um, my love for woodworking started in high school when I took my first day of wood shop class. I remember just the smell of, of wood and sawdust and just had that feeling like, wow, this is this is cool. I just caught the wood bug, I guess. I don't know what, what it is about it, but um, it just does something to you. You got into artwork to get out of the, the rut of being an electrician? Yeah, For, well, I got I, I got into artwork because it was something that I always felt like I, I wanted to do, but in high school that dream kind of died because like reality kind of sets in, I guess that whole idea of like, oh, you can be anything you want to be kind of gets smashed by the whole weight of society and reality going, maybe you can't, you know? So I didn't really have many options. It was, uh, I, I remember freshman year of high school, we thought we were all just gonna be pro skateboarders, you know? And somewhere within that transition <laughs> from freshman year to senior year, it all reality just kind of set in and it was like, I'm not gonna be any of these things. What? the hell am I gonna do for a living? Yeah, it was more, I think I, I didn't choose to be an, a tattoo artist uh, because I didn't wanna do a nine to five. I think I choose to be a tattoo artist or an artist in general because it's just something that's always come naturally that I've always loved.
So it yeah, gives me purpose. Why do you think you create like artwork? Initially, I created um, artwork just copying comic book artwork, um, trying to be as good as what I saw in the comics. So Todd McFarlane was a huge influence in my comic book work. I would literally have Spider-Man or Spawn, and I would just copy each page. Um, and then, you know, it, it became a way of going to another world and not being in reality. It was a world in which I created that I can control the environment and what I drew. It was definitely for an out. But then also, you know, I saw a lot of beauty, so I wanted to captivate that too. And, and just seeing how my mom and my dad, with everything they went through and my, and my brothers and sisters, I just wanted to create and capture that beauty. So you gravitated towards just kind of the organicness and what you can turn that wood into? I think what drew me to woodworking was just the fact that I could take something from nature, like a tree, and then it can be refined and sanded and shaped and, and cut and broken and become something beautiful. Just that whole creative side of me is a way, is like another way for me to express and how I feel and putting who I am, you know, out and onto something is just, it's, it feels good. Like I get, I do get a lot of self-worth, but I also get a lot of pride. And something that I never got the six year I was, I was an electrician, I never got any inclination of, so. So do you think that the artwork then helps you to cope with things that are going on internally or externally? Yeah, there are times when, I don't know, I might be feeling angry or might be I might be feeling just a certain way. And if I sit down and just start just doodling or drawing or kind of getting my mind on the paper, I feel a lot better. And I think also, too, is most of it, to be, for me, I think, is uh, it's not a deliberate thing. It's like, oh, I'm really mad right now, so I'm going to go paint a picture of madness. You know what I mean? It's more of a subconscious thing where it's driven in me to like put on paper things that are like deep, deep things that I'm probably not even most of the time aware of. And then now I create for a whole slew of different things. And then now looking back in retrospect, now why I realistically create, it's like I'm drawing things that I'm feeling inside and I'm trying to make beauty out of the ugliness that is stuck inside of me. So, and then that allowing me to navigate into a different mindset to create and go through these tunnels of, of thought processes, but it's constantly moving. It's like, ah, I can't, I can't keep up with it. Um, I often say it's like reels, a bunch of reels of film going through my head and I'm constantly jumping in, in each one to try to captivate what I'm, what I'm thinking. Do you think that you create outside of the purpose of creating? Like, is there a kind of a therapeutic reason why you create? I definitely think there's a therapeutic aspect to, to woodworking, especially when you're doing something that's repetitive and kind of monotonous at times. At least I find um, some people, I, I know that drives them crazy, but there's something about it that you just get in this zone you know, and you can't, uh, just the world just disappears and you're just focused on what you're doing and it just empties your mind. So do you find that there's like struggles that you're dealing with, that, that you subconsciously are dealing with your struggles and then after you paint them, you're like, whoa, I was dealing with some crazy stuff? Yeah, yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely like a, you can see internal struggle in a lot of my work. Most people, I think to most people, they just look at it and go, uh, whoa, uh, what is wrong with you? You know, like, why are you painting these horrific things and graphic things? And, you know, what, what is inside of you that fuels you to do, I don't know, that style of like artwork? When I look at it now, it's like, oh, there's so many of what I'm dealing with on this paper that nobody would ever understand or know unless I actually was like, oh, this is what I'm going through, you know? I think honestly, like, at least for me, what's on the forefront of my mind as far as if 
we say there's like a daily struggle and I think it's mainly just lust is like something that is always in the back of my mind that I feel like I'm struggling with no matter what that's this that's a constant struggle for me what are some struggles that you're going through and how do you use your art to kind of cope with those struggles I think the things that I struggle with is allowing people to get too close to me. Like I, I give a lot, but then when I don't feel that's reciprocated, then I get angry. But I don't talk to anybody about it. It's just like, oh, you're whack. Do you feel that there could possibly be something that outside of creating that you can be running from something so you go to your work work so the world becomes non-existent? Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely things that everyone runs from. You know, that's why people do drugs. That's why people drink. That's why people throw themselves in, into their work and become workaholics. There's things in, in our lives that, that are hard, that are hard to deal with. And we all have our vices, you know. We all give ourselves completely to something so that we can escape. As I think my artwork tells me more about myself than I understand, you know what I mean? Oh, that's what's going on with me? <laughs> because at the moment I'm just painting it, but when I really look at it and start to think about what does this mean, what does that mean, what, you know what I mean? Then I start learning about what's going on really inside. inside. All right. Now looking back at the age that I am running a lot from things that have happened to me in the past that I've never dealt with. It's like things that like happen at such a young age that your your brain realistically doesn't know how to compute this stuff. It's like a fried circuit. It's like and you have been scarred forever. Uh, one of those big things that I've come to the realization is being, you know, sexually molested at a young age by another man. Um, so to even navigate that, I didn't really. I just kind of did this weird thing where it was like that feeling that, that just go away from me. never spoke about it but I do remember trying to not ever be in that situation again and I thought okay maybe if I can just love people that wouldn't happen and but then there was these these different things that started happening um, in my life one of them you know I thought I can just love a lot and the first girl that I ever dated like realistically loved and loved her the best way I knew how I found out she was like sleeping with some dude that I knew and I never dealt with any of the emotions. So what I did was like, I don't want to deal with what's going on in my head. So I started pulling things into this kind of, this destructive cave crap, you know, with pornography, drinking, drugs, working. Working became my new pornography. I would work so hard so I don't have to think. And then I would listen to music all day so I wouldn't have to hear. And what would your struggles be? And how does your art help you cope with it? When I first got married, shortly after we had our first child, at that time in my life, I would definitely throw myself into my work and into you know, doing art even, painting, drawing. I think because I was really afraid of not knowing how to be a husband, how to be a dad. For me personally, the whole you know being molested thing was like I didn't understand it. You know, it was like the the security of being an innocent child was stripped away from me forever, never to be returned again. And I had to live with that. I don't know where that, that person is. And I had to navigate that. And then what made it worse is that I didn't t tell anybody. I 
didn't have a dad growing up. I mean, there was always a male authority figure around growing up, but my dad wasn't a part of my life. The years where I needed him, when I was growing up, becoming a man, he wasn't there. And that was hard. And I guess feeling, feeling inadequate that way and not knowing how to be a good dad, even how to be a husband to my wife, I think early on, I would use my work as an excuse. Like, oh, I have to provide, I have to, you know, take care of my family. And I would throw myself into work and, and in doing so, become the, the thing I was, I feared most of becoming that absentee father. I think what defeat what was defeating me every day was that I tried to deal with it myself. You can't deal with that kind of stuff yourself. You cannot live your life without expressing or talking to people about things that have happened to you or the addictions that you have or or things you just rabbit because I mean these things start to corrupt your brain. And they start to turn you into a monster. Like I was a complete monster. And I, like nobody can tell me anything. And, the, and, and what sucked even more is that I'm sitting here saying I believe in Jesus and Jesus this, Jesus that. And so it made it even worse to know what is right but do the complete opposite and then live as a hypocrite which brought even more shame and guilt on top of all this other crap that you're dealing with. Then it's just like, man. Let me drink some more. Let me work harder. Let me shut everybody out. Let me isolate myself so I don't have to talk to anybody. Because it's everybody else's problem, not mine. And do you feel that it's it's it kind of kind of silences you in a way to where you kind of start to internalize because you don't share about it? Oh, for sure. That's, the way I look at it, society is so driven by by lust has become something that was just natural to our society like it's on billboards it's in the streets it's you know the way people dress nowadays it's like and i sound like somebody from like the 50s when i start breaking it down but it's like this is the reality of it all there's just little triggers and little things that you know you see that you don't even really mean to see that take you places you don't really want to go you know i'd rather sometimes just like castrate myself and live a normal life, you know? Um, be free of it, be free of that battle. What are some of the triggers? I mean, right off the bat, if I didn't feel like loved when I was showing love, which is pretty whack because, you know, perfect love is never offended. My love was always conditional. It's like, if I love you, this needs to be reciprocated. If it's not, then F off. The triggers, I mean, so it's so crazy because I could be in the middle of this conversation and if I felt disrespected and not in a secure co uh, conversation or not loved, the person could literally be talking and I would already be like, you're dumb, go away, you know what I'm saying? And uh, living that way, that living that way so long and creating these neurological paths in your brain where your brain automatically shifts into these places and it becomes automatic, then everybody becomes a jerk. I think the reason why we internalize it, at least for me, I mean, there's a whole amount of shame to it. As much as society has allowed it and made lust such a selling point for so many things, whether in the media and life, it's in your face everywhere constantly. Most people don't understand, so you you internalize it. You just you're you filled with this shame that I can't talk about it with anybody. I can't share it with anyone. I'm not comfortable or close to anybody to tell them this because they're not going to understand it. So then it's like, I'm just going to pretend it's not there, you know, in a sense, and deal with it my own way. And I think naturally in my art has just come out without me even trying. It's, it's when people were really asking about my art, like, what is this and what is that? And 
and people that genuinely wanted to understand what my artwork means really made me kind of take a step back and go, yeah, what does that mean? Why am I painting like this? Is there something wrong with me? What is it? Like, if there is, like, what is it? And it's really, it all boils down to that, that internal struggle that's just constantly there in my mind, I think, is that you know, the whole lust thing. And like, lust as a sin itself is like a, it's such a innate desire that we have and it has to do with the body being beautiful and you know our eyes instantly pick up on that and are attracted to the beauty of it but at the same time lust is such a destructive and disgusting like you know thing so like when I paint when I draw these girls they're always like this dichotomy of, of beauty and like mesmerizing and evil and disgusting all rolled up into one because I feel like that's what's in me you know what I mean that's what's like it lying innate in me all the time so it just comes out in your ways what do you feel that your choices have been up to this point there was a time where, where I didn't clearly see it um, I've gotten better at it, but it's a constant, constant battle. You know, it's a warring of, of your flesh and what you, your own desires, what you want to do, your own ambitions, versus what you ought to do. You know, I mean, if I just lived by my emotions and did whatever I felt like, I wouldn't have a family. <laughs> just by. By God's grace, I still have my family and I'm still, you know, every day growing. You don't want to be the absentee father. Yeah. You want to be there for your children. Right. What's triggering you even to have that thought process when you are providing for your children and being a father that's there? What's bringing you back to, hey, I'm not being here, I'm being an absentee father, when in actuality you are? I think I think what, what keeps me diving into my work and, and being the very thing that I don't want want to be that, that I had to deal with growing up ultimately it's selfishness you know not wanting to, to deal with the rigors of being a father being a true father you know being a dad I mean it's one thing to be a father can father anybody can father a child any male can father a child but not any anyone can be a dad and so because it's hard <laughs> it's hard to be a dad you gotta give yourself up you gotta die to yourself so that you can be there for this other life that you create so what's preventing you from from living that free and happy life, like these are my girls, I'm taking care of them, I'm working hard, I'm providing them, I'm present, I'm putting my selfishness down. What's preventing you from seamlessly living that and it's just streaming out of you? I think what's preventing me is is just my own selfishness. And just wanting to, to achieve certain things in my life that I haven't achieved yet. You know, and there's a cost. Am I going to spend time with my kids or am I going to go and focus on my own projects? You know, it's like a choice. It, it, it boils down to a choice. We all have a choice to make. We could choose A or B. You know, we, we, whatever we choose, we deal with the consequences or the rewards. Being molested is one of those things where you just want to kill somebody. But pornography is something that kills you. It really gets in there and starts ripping away at you. Um, but it's weird because it's kind of like, I want more, but I hate this. Like, it was like rust on a ship. It started and it started eating away the vessel. And it started eating away and these holes started happening. And those holes became massive holes to where all of that stuff just started flowing freely. The lust, the hunger for it, and, and nothing was satisfying. Even real relationships became unsatisfying.
How did that whole pornography train start? It started super young. And I always had this, like, shame or guilt in the back of my mind. Somewhere even, like, even that young. Not even understanding what it was, but knowing somewhere that it wasn't healthy or that it wasn't. There was something off about it. You know, at this, but at the same time, I couldn't stop. I couldn't turn away from it. It was so mesmerizing. And so that kind of was the beginning of something that I didn't even understand. Something I didn't know was going to happen to where you can't even walk down the street anymore without thinking about it. You can't, uh, you, you know, your, your whole life in one way or another is revolving around this one thing. It's such a force that you can't even talk about or share. It becomes this dark routine. What would the picture of living right outside of that type of thought process and that internal struggle that you're going through, like, what would that look like for you? Um, it would be being free of, of, I think, objectifying, like, the female body, to be honest. Not having that desire all the time. Not even having that curiosity. If it's like your eyes, at least for me, it's like my eyes are always hungry and it, you can never satisfy them. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how much you look at. You know what I mean? Your eyes are always wandering. You're never satisfied. And it becomes, it's almost frustrating because it's like you'd be driving down the street and you catch something in your peripherals and it's like, it's almost instinctive. You know, it's such a habit. And then you catch yourself in the minute. You're like, dude, you're driving. You know, like you're going to, crash over this shit <laughs> like you're gonna get in an accident and what are you gonna tell people you know like, there is a cute girl on the corner come on now so it's just it's ridiculous so yeah just being free of that would be nice so if you're not telling somebody to at least be checked um, and you're, you're trying to pray, which helps, but it's like you need to confess this stuff and let it out. You need to talk about it to somebody because you cannot do it on your own. You cannot win the battle of pornography by yourself. It's one of those things that make you into a complete monster. And it, it affects you differently from all these other things that might happen to you. Yeah. For me, like with pornography, I can justify, oh, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not, I could be sleeping with a prostitute or I could be on, at a strip club. I could be enabling all those people. It's like, oh, well, I'm not doing any of those things. So I'm okay. I'm only hurting me, you know? But in reality, that's not really what's happening at all. Not only are you damaging yourself, you're damaging any hope or future you're, you're gonna have with any girlfriend or boyfriend or soulmate you know and I still to this day am struggling with it and I see the the damages of it that I'm dealing with within my relationships you know I see the effects of it and what it has done and it's just ugh it's like you know, relearning I don't know it's harder for me I look at some people who is just who don't have that addiction it's just health seems to come so naturally to them and I almost envy that because it's not easy for me to live that like normal life, I guess, with a significant other. Like, pornography has kind of screwed all that up for me and like really messed with my brain. If I could go back to that day where I found that pornography seconds before and just be like, I don't think I want to look there. Or I don't think I'm going to go there. Or I don't think I'm going to visit my dad this week. Ugh, I would give anything to just put it down or to shut it out or to never look at it again and just forget it. But can't do that, so just gonna have to face it. You mentioned having an out with your artwork, do you think there's something that you are running from? I think that the artwork allows me to speak without speaking because speaking about it to me would put me in a vulnerable situation that I don't want to be in. Um, nor do I want to talk about my past, nor do I think it's any of your business, 
nor do I want you to get close to me, so on and so forth. So it's kind of like, this is my artwork, look at it, don't ask me too many questions. Um, that's why I say, you know, it's open for interpretation. That's my kind of way out, so I don't have to talk about it. But if you look at my artwork, it's definitely yelling to the viewer that there's definitely some things going on internally. I'm creating like artwork to be able to speak to the canvas so I don't have to speak to reality or speak to humans. Cause I don't want to be judged. I don't want to hear that, oh, oh, you know, poor this guy or whatever, or whatever you want to think about me. Like I, I you know, it's kind of like the switch comes off and then I just become a jerk and I'm like, go away. Let me just paint because my paintings don't talk. And it's interesting too because now that I'm helping artists, I can see how artists can become introverted. Because some of the happiest moments in artists' lives are when they're alone with their artwork. And they don't have to have someone say, hey, put pink down or put blue down or maybe put some wings here. It's like, world shut up. Let me just be in this world that I've created. So actually, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, it's, it's running from putting myself in front of people to be able to talk so I don't feel judged in a way that might hurt my feelings. I mean, if I'm being honest with myself, I'm super sensitive. I might be like, hey, what's up? And then you say something and you're already, I've already checked you off. What you just said is just like powerful because you were trying to do the best that you can in being a father, but then you threw yourself into your work to answer the father responsibilities but you found yourself not being there which was the absentee father that you were just talking about and like when the times that i did have off and i wasn't working and i was home i found myself constantly like veering towards doing my own little projects you know working on my own art or working on this project and and a lot of times it was projects for the house like oh i have to make this for us you know this this table for our you know whatever or make i have to make our bed i have to work on this you know and i would just ignore my family and and not give them the time that they need because all in the name of you know being a good dad you mm -hmm. know or, or being you know providing I guess is, is was the key word being a provider that was like that was the thing that really uh, I felt I had to do at that time the most important thing what stops you from being happy and does it drive you to create your artwork I think what stops me from being happy is my choices, my thought patterns, my, my not letting go of the past, having this love affair of, with misery. Like, oh, I'm so ruined, I'm so damaged, no one gets me. And let me take this misery on for a date for 30 plus years, because misery is the only thing that can really understand me. Yeah, I think like if you look at my artwork, it's definitely yelling at you. Having these masks in my imagery and all that kind of stuff, because you know, I can definitely do the whole song and dance, like I got everything together, I got all these businesses, I got all, you know, I got, I make money and I'm a successful artist according to the world and you know, all this kind of stuff and um, you know, and putting myself in front of Jesus um, and saying, oh, I got it because you did it and I don't even know if you exist. I would question my relationship with Jesus because it just didn't seem real. It's like you like this massive God that's like, oh, you're really listening to my prayer. And if you are, then why did this happen and this happen and this happen? So I struggled with that in my artwork and you can see it masks and suit and ties and just these miserable faces and people falling you know, to addictions and people being hoarded to these these paths and vices. Like if I didn't have artwork, I would have gone mad for real. Because it's like when you know what to do or what you should be doing and you're doing the exact opposite and you're not talking about it to anybody and then you just marinate in it, then you realistically go mad. I had 
insomnia, all kinds of craziness, drinking all the time and then just choosing to make my mind so filthy and waking up and then looking at yourself like, man, it's so tiring to be with myself. And like when you get to that point where you just become, you know, you don't, you don't even care to care. I think artwork allowed me to care somewhat and be able to show my emotions on there, on a piece of canvas. I wasn't always aware of what art did for me, even as a child. I grew up in a home where my parents didn't like each other very much, so they would constantly be fighting, arguing, throwing things, yelling, cussing, whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it, it would get intense. And I would, I was the kid that always, like, I would find solace in my room just drawing. And so even back then, I was using art as, like, an expression of getting just stuff out and, like, you know, like creating a way to, I don't know. I, I, I didn't understand it, you know, and I still don't a lot of it. You know what? I found that when I, when I am giving, when I do put my family first and I give them the time that they need, that I become inspired. But when I'm not, when I'm trying to, to just take my time and hold on to my time and, and make sure I get time for my, myself and my own projects, they, they come out kind of lame and then it gets frustrating and then I'm angry and then I'm like being a jerk dad, jerk husband and nothing, it kills, it kills my inspiration. I mean, you can look at my art and you can, I can see it now, like even some of the stuff, like I was just like, ugh, there's so much garbage and that's why a lot of it is really dark and that's why a lot of it doesn't have a lot of color and that's why a lot of it is, twisted and, and not nice because I think that's that real me that's been rotting inside me for so long it's finally it's coming out I think in the most positive way possible that I can do the most least destructive way I can expel this stuff you know aside from sharing you evoke this like emotion to different people there's people that are on your wavelength and then there's people that are not. But the people that are not, it's like, I appreciate that because I understand that it is something that's off. It is something that's scary. It is something that's weird and it's not comfortable. And you're not comfortable looking at it. it makes me understand that this is real and this is helping and this is good and I'm okay with that, you know? And then the guy that's like, I want this tattoo on my body. I'm like, this dude knows where I'm coming from. That's it, I'm into that too. How do you take all this information that you've just given me and, and how does it coincide with your artwork now and your creative process? I prioritize. That's what it boils down to. It's having priorities. What really matters in life? Does being an amazing furniture maker and woodworker, is that what's really important to me? All the accolades and all the magazines and design magazines or building the, the coolest props for whatever TV show or movie. Is that what really matters to me? Because when you die, what, what do you have left? You know, do, is anybody going to remember the guy who made this chair or this table or built this and that in this movie? People don't even remember movies. The legacy you leave behind is your children. If you have children or who you affected throughout your life, who you had a positive impact on. What other lives have you changed just through being you? And what are you doing to move in the direction to, to get away from that and, and get out of that thought process? I think a lot of it is community, mainly just having people to talk to and not internalizing it as much. Being closer and closer with like men that I respect, people that have been through it, people that understand what I'm going through, because you can blab on and share to any old person on the street, but they're going to think you're crazy most of the time, or just not understand. So it's really, it's hard for me to find people that I respect as far as their wisdom, because I feel like they need to have, they need to be dealing with the same thing I am, and then I can hear you out. Then I understand, it's like, okay, you know what I'm going through, I, I know you got some wisdom for me, you got something for me, because I feel like me building it up inside it becomes this monster and it starts to come out in other ways not only in my art but i start treating people like crap because it's just for me there's so much guilt and shame attached to it 
that it's like, I can't talk about anything because I don't want to destroy anybody, especially my people that I love, people that I care about. Because there was so, almost so much shame and condemnation and so much guilt and so much wicked and dirtiness that it was like, man, I'm so filthy that no one would understand. So why even talk about it? And do you feel that, you know, not sharing these struggles that you go, that going on internally in your mind also kills your present, your being now, being present with your family? You're kind of dealing with this all inside. Like if I didn't have anybody to talk to about it, yeah, I would just be dealing with it on my own. It would be festering and there was a time where I was kind of just becoming resentful, resentful towards my wife, resentful towards my kids, feeling like they're holding me back from achieving a certain level of in my career or whatever. And those were dark times. I've kind of like come out of that. Thank God. Did sharing help you be free? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think just being honest. Being honest is a habit, I think. And then being dishonest is a habit. And I created such a habit of dishonesty in my life because I felt like I had to hide. You hide one thing and then you got to lie about that thing. Lying isn't just not dealing with it. Lying is just digging a trench to be even more unhappy. Do you feel that not sharing your past struggles kills your present? I think that when you don't share with people that are trusting to you and that don't judge you, you can't live right, honestly. And it's just funny because society kind of tells you you gotta do all this, you gotta be this, you know, be a man and all this stuff. You know, when I started talking to all these men and, and just kind of sharing realistically what's happened in my past, man, everybody's, all these men are dying off one by one because they ain't, no one's sharing anything. They don't have the safe ground. They feel judged by their wife. They feel judged by their job. They don't feel adequate enough. They're not making enough money. They gotta have this. They gotta do this. This is what a man looks like. This is how you have to be. Well, nowhere in that list does it say men share, be vulnerable and emotional. No, that's, that's opposite of being a man according to the world standards. And I bought that lie. For me personally, that's living a, the life of a monster. An empty vessel that is, is eating up everything that his flesh desires and, and completely contaminating his mind and living this facade and fake life. And it just is, it, it weighs you down. There's, it's, it's nonsense. The more I pursue things myself, the more selfish I am about it, the more selfish ambition I have, and the more I'm, I'm driven by that, the less creative inspiration I have, um, the less happier I am, the less happier my family is. It's only when I completely empty myself and give to my family and spend time with them, that's when I become inspired. That's when I actually create something of worth, something that's that, that I'm happy with. It's the only time I produce something that's worth producing, I guess. Because, I mean, I feel like everyone has addictions. If we're going to be honest with each other, everybody's struggling with something. Everybody's got something um, they're not telling or they're not showing or they're, they're hiding. A lot of it you're aware of and a lot of it you're not aware of. Until you start sharing it, you know? Until you start talking about it. Until you start word vomiting on somebody you can trust. We live in such surface lives. Even our closest friends, we won't share the deepest, darkest parts of us because it's too much shame, it's too much guilt, it's too much fear of the repercussions of that. It's like, oh, they're not gonna be able to handle this. They're not gonna be able to handle the real me. But when you just internalize it, it just starts to rot, you know what I mean? It's like a, a fridge with the power off, you know, all that food just goes to waste and it just sits in there it's worse you got to clean out that fridge you got to pull all that crap out it was it's weird because i remember the first time i was sharing just that just talking about it with somebody and realizing that they're not running away from me they're not judging me they're not changing their uh, feelings about me because of what i'm telling them was you know empowering enough to be like okay you know, I need, to, I need to step out of the shadows and live in the limelight 
and just kind of like tell people, at least people I can trust. Do you feel, just talking about it right now, that you kind of feel, you know, lifted from it? You kind of feel a sense of freedom even sharing about this to where you don't go back to that solitude. Do you feel that even bringing it up and talking to your wife and, and allowing her to hear what you have to say internally allows you to become free? Yeah, I think talking about it absolutely brings freedom. When you share, it's just your true self, your honest self. You're finally starting to get rid of all that garbage. You're starting to get rid of all the lies and all the BS and all the fake, all the, the walls you have to put up to, for society to make people think that you're a, a normal, whatever that means, to look semi-normal for people, you know, functional, I guess you would say. I think if I can sum up the worst thing that could ever happen to my life was that these things happened to me and I didn't tell anybody. And I wouldn't even share them with my wife. And I put him so far on the back burner, even in praying and all that kind of stuff. Sharing wasn't even something that I lived. And I, and I honestly think, you know, in those times of desperation, of complete brokenness, like in my prayer time, really getting real with Jesus, like, yo, I need to come into this room and communicate with you and let you know what's happening to me in my heart and my soul and my mind, and really articulating why I'm pissed, angry, sad, and all this kind of stuff, and really leaning on him to to have the strength too, like in those dark times when I didn't have anybody, it was kind of, it's kind of weird because now that I think about it, it's like Jesus was the canvas and he allowed me to put my emotions on canvas and he does it so gracefully and he doesn't push me or judge me or tell me that there's a time frame in which I need to get to figure this out, but he definitely puts me in, in a situation to where I learn from it and now now that I have shared from it, I, I do feel a lot free. You know, I've, I've heard that saying, the truth will set you free. It's like, oh great, that's good for you, you know? But that's not happening to me. And then when I actually did it, like it was realistically, I did feel a weight come off of me. To the point where it sounds kind of corny. Like, oh yeah, I feel lighter. Like for real, I, I did. T telling the truth and actually sharing about you know these things that happened to me even just now as we're, we're talking about this and this whole subject it, it's it's great because it brings clarity to the whole process you know in your mind you like you think okay I know I need to do this this is the right thing to do so okay I'll do it but talking about it and just sharing about it and having conversation about it and looking at it in depth it definitely is is freeing because it gives you a clear overall picture of what is happening and how to deal with it. Anytime you find somebody you can just be honest with, you know, because that's, I think, how we were designed to be. We're just designed to live who we are, you know what I mean? And with all this uh, self-destructive stuff, we start to think, oh, I can't share who I am, even in, because it's broken, I can't share it and it only just perpetuates more brokenness. So once you finally let all that out, you start to rebuild, repair. I had built this castle of leave me alone. That's the worst. It sucks. Realistically, when you're sharing with people, they're going through some major stuff too. And it's like, well, I didn't know you were going through that. And that what I just shared to you can help you and it has helped you and what you're sharing with me helps me. And that, that community and growth within individuals that you can trust and talking about it is a revival of one's life, really. How can we collectively help each other to be free? What kind of information would you give other dads in your same situation to help them be free? I'd say that if you want to find yourself, you have to lose yourself. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will find it. And that's so true because you're not gonna have a life when it comes to family and having kids. You're not gonna have a life, they're your life. It, unless you die to yourself and lose yourself and give yourself completely to them, it's not gonna last. I think it's, being honest with each other 
being real, being uncomfortable. My plea to everybody would be, man, we really, we really need to share and help each other by talking and not being so judgmental and not be so fake. The second I, I shared with someone and motivated truth with truth, it's like I told the truth, truth automatically came out. I spoke the truth and truth automatically was reciprocated to me. And I was like, wow, like it's, it's so imperative that you do not, like if you're living a life right now and you don't have at least two or three guys that you can sit down and talk to and be like, yo, this is, this is what I'm going through. And this is what's happening with me and my wife, with my household. This is how I feel about my kids right now. And let's, let's talk about it and how you can help. If you don't have those people in your life, I personally feel that you are floating in a world and you're constantly trying to grab some type of foundation to be able to grab it and like, oh, I can actually talk to this person and just completely divulge all of this stuff out because it's just kind of like all of this junk comes out. If you can just imagine death and just misery and pride and anger and lust and all this kind of stuff just coming out of your body and just all over the place, um, I think that would be good. What would you tell other people? How can we help each other to, to be free? I think, uh... For me, the hardest part, I think for most addicts, is coming to the terms that you are an addict. That whole classic, denial, 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 denial. You know, you're like, I don't need a 12 step. That's for crazy people. Those are for, that's for the person who can't control what they're doing, but I have this under control. And that's the hardest part, I think, for us, is to really say, this is running out of control. This is something that I have lost all control of. And it's not comfortable. It's not fun. It's not easy. But if you don't, if you just keep building it up and keep hiding it and pretending and putting on your makeup and painting that perfect picture for the world to see, you're never going to get better. Like there's no easy button for getting out of addiction. You know, it's just sticking with it, finding people you can trust, finding friends that you can trust and communicating with them constantly and being honest with yourself constantly I think I can I still to this day can catch myself like justifying or manipulating the truth you know just for my own benefit so I feel better about it be honest be honest with yourself just be honest with yourself it sucks because a lot of times we don't even want to see ourselves as we are we, we can't even love ourselves because it's so much pain, so much guilt or shame. Like, I, don't want, I just want that to be my closet. I can just keep that, you know. I think that's what I would tell somebody is just, one of these days you're, that closet's gonna fill up so much that it's gonna come off the hinges and blow up and then in front of everyone. It's, you choose, you know. I think it's better if you just choose the time and place where I'm gonna talk about it in a safe space and start getting help. Um, I've seen a lot of people who've hit rock bottom, you know, and it's, it's humiliating. Some of us, including myself, have needed that. We needed that wake up call. We needed the brick to the face to wake up because this is not healthy. And I can't deny that it's here anymore because it's hurting people. So it's like a plea, like, please go talk to somebody realistically talk to them, not this fake facade. The relationship is being able to talk to someone truthfully and honestly and them not judging you. And, and, and then letting you finish talk, like shut up for a second and let someone talk. It's important. Because the second you might say something and they're really about to say something, you say something, bam, they won't say it. And it's locked up and they can live another five years because you just didn't shut up for two seconds and allow that person to talk. I think also too, I think one of the main things that I didn't mention like to help people is like leaning on God for a lot of it. You know what I mean? Ultimately it's like you gotta start leaning on God for a lot of that stuff because it really is a coming to terms that you don't have power over some of the things that you do. 
coming to terms with the fact that you can't control some of the desires you have, and then going, okay, I mean, it's like, Jesus, like, a, that's my rock, I'm gonna lean on that and be like, God, oh, this is me, ooh, not pretty. Yeah, I know, you know, but he accepts me, and that's what's dope, is like, he was the first one that accepted me, you know, and then it was like, he was the one that encouraged me all those years, you know what I mean? But it was baby steps God kind of walked me through and encouraged me. He's like, hey, maybe you should do this. And it was never like, go do this. Do this. You know, I never, it was like, hey, like literally I would hear this in my head and I know it wasn't my voice because no way would I be thinking this. It's like, hey, maybe you should go to this Bible study. Uh, no, that's uncomfortable. Oh, but just check it out. Ugh. I'm gonna go. And I learned so much about myself, so much about what was going on, because even then I had no idea all the stuff that was that I was carrying. If we are truthfully and honestly the greatest works of art ever created on this planet, then what are we doing killing ourselves by not talking and sharing because that's what's happening. We're, when, when I don't share and talk, I ultimately grab all of these things in this, in this cave and I rot in it. I think the most important thing that we need to do is share and talk to people and be real and, and allow people to be real and honest. That's what I think we should do. Awesome.